as you connect these themes to the lived realities of marginalized people today. And we've been trying to see them from the perspective of um, not just, again, from scripture, but how the gospel really motivates us to uh, have a different perspective on these issues. And so we're praying that this series will be helpful for those in the process of deconstructing their faith and also an encouragement to those who want to be equipped um, on these themes and topics so that uh, you know how to engage them uh, when you're outside of the church. And so if this is your first time uh, here, or if you've missed the early part of our series, we highly encourage you to listen to the first two sermons to get kind of like the bigger uh, framework that we're trying to build for the people here. You can find those on our YouTube channel if you're not sure where it is. Again, go to the announcement page or, or the PDF thing on the QR code in the front. So today we're exploring the theme of immigrants, refugees, and sojourners. This is our second to last sermon in the series. Next week we'll be uh, covering the issue of uh, misogyny from the Bible. So on the issue of immigrants, refugees, and sojourners, I want to begin with a statistic uh, from a, a poll in 2018 that was conducted by the Washington Post. And this particular poll found that the group in America least likely to believe that the U.S. has a responsibility to accept refugees or white evangelical Protestants. An entire 68% of them believe that the U.S. did not have a responsibility to accept refugees. That's more than two-thirds um, who did not believe this. And in my journey of deconstructing my faith, I want to say that perhaps there was no statistic or data that jaded me more than this particular one when it came out on the news. This was a big, um, it, it just created a crisis in me, in my heart, in my faith, just in terms of what is Christianity? Like, who are, what, who are our brothers and sisters in the faith? How did we get from the biblical commands of loving the poor, the orphan, and the widow, and the sojourner to becoming so nationalistic and so selfish in our faith? Of course, I'm not any better in terms of selfishness. It comes out different ways. But this particular one, I thought in my, again, my own arrogance and pride, isn't this one so obvious? And so I wrestled with this quite, for quite a bit, and it really put me in a dark place spiritually. Um, and I had to revisit again, what does the Bible actually say about immigrants and refugees? Is it political to talk about this and so we can't even bring it up from the pulpit and what role does the gospel play in all of this and so let's start with definitions the bible summarizes immigrants and refugees under the word sojourner and this word isn't one that's typically used today so it requires some defining so i got this again simple definition for you uh which is a sojourner is a personal group residing either temporarily or permanently in a community and place that is not primarily their own um, and is dependent on the goodwill of that community for their continued existence. So it's a broad definition, a category of people um, that encompasses immigrants, refugees, and other displaced people. The word sojourner is mentioned 81 times in the Bible, and most of the times um, that it's mentioned, it's in reference to how to treat them. So whether it's political or not, it doesn't really matter. It's in the Bible, so we have to talk about it. So I have three points for today's message. The first is the material care of sojourners. The second is the spiritual care of sojourners. And the third is the heart for caring for sojourners. All right, the material care, the spiritual care, and the, and the heart for caring for sojourners. So the first point, the material care of sojourners, comes from Leviticus chapter 23, verse 22. This is what it says. And when you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap your field right up to its edge, nor shall you gather the gleanings after your harvest. You shall leave them for the poor and for the sojourner. I am the Lord your God. Now, we saw many times before how whiteness in our society fuels the right and left ideological warfare that is currently wreaking havoc in our country. And so for many, not all, for, but for many conservatives, the material care of sojourners 
has been uh, practically non-existent as we see in this Washington Post poll. Many conservative Christians are content with just sending missionaries to refugees overseas and to uh, impoverished or war-torn areas, but are opposed to having them resettle in our country. They're content with providing spiritual care overseas by, by sharing the gospel with them and maybe even sharing donations or, or like donated clothes or used clothes, right? Or unwanted Super Bowl clothes. And, 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 but do very little to provide long-lasting material, physical, and social care. And so many have rightfully accu accused this approach of being imperialistic, where religion is used to tame the native population through conversion while doing nothing, or if not worsening, the livelihood of the locals. This is a legitimate criticism we ought to listen to and learn from. And in the book of Leviticus, we see here that God's people were given laws for their new kingdom that they were about to establish after they left Egypt. And this particular law in verse 22 was given to them while they were still sojourners themselves as they traveled through the wilderness to the promised land. And so the, though the laws found in this particular book may not be directly applicable to us now uh, because they were strictly for the kingdom of Israel and we're not in the kingdom of Israel anymore, we can still appreciate these laws and learn from them the character of them because it points us to the greater kingdom of God which Jesus would usher in through his death and resurrection. And this kingdom of God is, is where we are now citizens of today. And so this kingdom of Israel, you can, again, think of it as like, um, you know, Windows 90, 98 or something, right? And then the kingdom of God is uh, Windows 12 just came out, right? But imagine it not being buggy and forever perfect. That's what it is, right? And so, but there's still things about uh, Windows 95 we can appreciate. We see, oh, oh, we, oh, I can see how Windows 12 got here today, right? That's the same thing with the kingdom of Israel. We see this, and we're like, oh, the heart behind it is still present today. If not, it's expounded upon even more encompassing. And so, again, here in the kingdom of Israel, we see the same concern for the most vulnerable of society that Jesus demonstrates and commands us Christians to follow him in. And so this particular law in the Old Testament was a policy that the Israelites had to obey and that the kingdom of Israel in the Old Testament was supposed to enforce as an institution. And it's, what it says is that during autumn or the fall, when farmers would harvest their fields, the farmers aren't allowed to harvest all of the land, but leave the edges of their farms unharvested. So imagine if a farm was like a circle, a big circle, right? And so imagine a concentric circle where um, farmers could harvest the inner circle, but the outer circle had to be left alone. That's what this law is saying. Leave alone the outer circle. Why? So that the poor and the sojourners who don't own farms or could pay for their own food um, could eat and profit off of it. The poor and the sojourner could harvest this and they could either eat it for themselves or they could sell it in the market, make money and do what they can with the money to invest and, and maybe even buy their own plot of land eventually. And in one sense, you know, it makes it, it, it like I get why a policy like this might exist uh, to take care of the poor from your own country, right? They're your they're your own countrymen. They're like your distant cousins back then. They're all related somehow, and so it makes sense. All right, we're tr we're trying to help each other out, but God goes beyond this. It's very radical because. This is not uniformly practiced across other civilizations at the time. He says not only to take care of your own poor, but other poor people from other countries. Take care of poor foreigners, the war refugees, the immigrants, the migrants leaving their famine-stricken countries. But God, these people don't pay taxes. They don't contribute to the economy. They just come to benefit off of our hard work and leave, and they just leave all their trash behind once they leave. They're just traveling through. They're poor and they're filthy and they have diseases. 
What if they're criminals fleeing from the law? Why should we take care of them and give away all of our extra harvest that we could use for ourselves? His response to this claim, this this question, isn't a rationale explaining why this policy actually, you know, might help immigrants to settle down and contribute to the economy in the long run, like we hear today, or how this positively impacts the kingdom of Israel's relationship with neighboring countries. It's not, God doesn't reason with his people here. He anticipates his objection, but he doesn't reason with them. In fact, his answer isn't politically correct at all. As if he anticipates this objection, he concludes this portion of the law with the words, I am the Lord your God. In other words, know your place, human. I am your God. I am Yahweh the Lord who demonstrated unimaginable power to rescue you from slavery where, when you were once sojourners. Don't get this wrong. He doesn't give you data, statistics, peer-reviewed journal articles about why this might benefit the economy. He says, I am the Lord, your God, period. These words are meant to strike fear into those who might be tempted to mistreat foreigners. Some might say, oh, but that's terrible. What kind of God would be so mean and threatening? But let's be honest, that's like saying, man, why are our laws against murder so terrible? I mean, as long as you're not guilty of murdering someone, why should it matter to you? Like, shouldn't we want laws that are uh, like that enact justice, justice against murderers? Shouldn't we want strict laws against murder? I mean, I'm glad we have these strict laws against murderers. Likewise, if God sounds mean and threatening towards xenophobic nationalists, so what? I'm glad God has little tolerance towards this sin. For the Bible to have such, quote, woke laws written 3,000 years ago makes him all the more believable. Makes the Bible all the more believable. It makes God that much more worthy of our praise, does it not? God cares about the material the social, the bodily, the physical well-being of sojourners, and whatever influence we may have, whether it's hosting refugee families, policymaking, or even simply going out and voting, Christians have a duty to uphold the dignity of sojourners today. Folks, this isn't being political. It's being biblical. You know, during the Protestant Reformation, Roman Catholic persecution was so severe that Protestants had to flee their countries uh, to safe havens like uh, the city-state of Geneva in modern-day Switzerland. And during this time, uh, Protestant refugees from all over Europe uh, gathered into hotspots like Geneva. And and a a particular French refugee and pastor named John Calvin was asked to be one of the pastors in Geneva. And so if Martin Luther is considered the father of the Reformation, John Calvin was considered the brains of the Reformation. And he's also the father of the Reformed tradition, a tradition our church can, direct, uh, can trace a direct lineage to. And so Calvin oftentimes gets a bad rep for being this stuffy theologian obsessed with like the doctrine of predestination. But that couldn't be further from the truth. As a refugee himself, he could not ignore the biblical commands to love sojourners. But as massive numbers of refugees migrated to uh, to Geneva, there was an increasing problem of xenophobia, nationalism, of of, of random attacks against refugees. People in Geneva, the native Genevans started to believe that, that, uh, and it was partially true, that there were less jobs and wages were going down and they were upset. So they were randomly attacking refugees. And so John Calvin, being a pastor, didn't just 
step back and say, well, I just have to preach the gospel and ignore what's going out outside of these walls. The reform, and, and this is where the Reformed tradition really is helpful here. Calvin also disciplined his church members who were guilty of xenophobia, of attacking refugees, of verbally assaulting them. They were kicked out of the church for, time, for a time. There was at least one recorded instance where someone was sentenced to death for almost beating to death a refugee. And some might say, oh, that's so harsh. How could they do that? But you know, nobody in the city, like all the believers in the city, didn't object to this because they believed that to be a Christian required sometimes such harsh measures if you were that blatantly racist or xenophobic. And so to tackle this issue, Calvin, with the city leaders, um, wanted to address this on a systemic level, on an institutional level. And at this time in European history, lending money for inter on interest was illegal. This was implemented by the Catholic Church. It was illegal. So, and this was, they borrowed this from the New Testament where high interest loans were considered sinful. Right? We, we even hear about this today about high interest loans being uh, 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 taking advantage of the poor. And so Calvin reformed this institution because he saw how refugees and entrepreneurs didn't have the capital to start businesses and get back on their own feet. So he pushed for the legalization of loans with low interest rates. And this is revolutionary. No one had done this before, believe it or not. No one had done this before. And, and he encouraged the upper class of Geneva to loan out their money for these purposes to help the poor. The result was that Geneva thrived as an economic hub in just a single generation, and Calvin's economic policies laid the groundwork for Western Europe's financial boom, as other Reformed Christians did the same in their own countries. You want to know where and how Western Europe got its economic power? It started from this, the single institutional reform. And in his sermon on Galatians chapter 6, verse 9 through 11, he reminds his congregation, there's a quote there. Um, we cannot but behold our own face as it were in the glass in the person that is poor and despised. Though he were the furthest stranger, though he were the furthest stranger in the world, let a Muslim or barbarian back at, back at the time, it's a non-European, come among us, and yet, inasmuch as he's a man or woman, he brings with him a looking glass wherein we may see that he is our brother and neighbor. Meaning, if you see someone that is poor, that is not like you in ethnicity, God is giving you a looking glass to which you see yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. Imagine quoting Calvin, the father of Reformed theology and Reformed churches after xenophobic attacks against Muslims spiked in the years following 9-11. And yet Calvin was speaking about this hundreds of years ago. Second, um, the spiritual care of sojourners. Exodus 12, verse 48 to 49. If a stranger shall uh, sojourn with you and would keep the Passover to the Lord, let all his males be circumcised, that he may come near and keep the Passover. He shall be a native. He shall be as a native of the land. But no uncircumcised person shall eat of it, of the Passover feast. There shall be one law for the native and for the stranger who sojourns among you. If many conservatives then are guilty of imperialistic tendencies, then many progressives are guilty of neglecting the soul care of sojourners. It's not a coincidence that the vast majority of progressive Christian denominations have been rapidly declining in numbers over the past 50 years, while conservative denominations have grown or have maintained uh, their numbers. Some progressive denominations don't even have uh, like a stable missions agency anymore. And so whether at home or abroad, they're content on pursuing the material and social care of sojourners while neglecting their spiritual care, meaning leading them to faith in Christ and, re and, and repentance from their sins because it's offensive. We don't want to make them feel judged. So why talk about sin? But the book of Exodus was written 
during the same time as Leviticus, it's no surprise then that God, as God commands his people to provide material care for sojourners, he anticipates sojourners inquiring about, and com- about their faith and converting as a result. But this was no easy feat. Back in those days, gods were tied to your family or tribal lineage. It was a very, very intimate thing. It's, it, it, it was part of your identity as a, fa- as a member of a family. And so to, to become a worshiper of Yahweh meant renouncing your former gods, essentially cutting off your family lineage and starting all over as an adopted Israelite. This is very radical. It just meant to say, I'm no longer part of one family and have joined another. And so if a sojourner who is not an Israelite wanted to celebrate the most important festival and worship, and worship Yahweh during Passover, the men had to get circumcised exactly like how adults, uh, adult converts today would get baptized if they profess faith in Jesus so that they could eat the elements of communion. This Old Testament formula is the basis for the New Testament practice of adult conversion, baptism, and then communion. Adult conversion, circumcision, Passover. But for this to happen and the number of God's family uh, to increase, what must the Israelites do? First, the Israelites must know what they believe and share their faith with sojourners. You have to know the gospel. You have to know how to explain it, even in its most basic form. You don't have to be a theologian. Back then, they didn't even have Bibles at their homes, and yet they knew the basics of their faith. Just as the Israelites would have had to explain to sojourners that the Passover feast comes from the time when God passed over from judging the households of the Israelites for their sins through the blood of the sacrificial lamb. We must explain how God passed over judging the households of Christians for our sins through the blood of the true and better sacrificial lamb, Jesus. This care for the spiritual state of sojourners is a biblical command that accompanies the material care of sojourners. It's both and. Third and final point, the heart of caring for sojourners. Exodus 23 verse 9. You shall not oppress a sojourner. You know the heart of a sojourner, for you were sojourners in the land of Egypt. Finally, God reveals the heart motivation for why we ought not to oppress sojourners to the sins of commission and sins of omission, meaning by actively pursuing their harm or by neglecting to do the right thing. God reminds the Israelites, you know what it's like to be a sojourner. You know how difficult and painful it was. You know what it's like to be oppressed. So do unto others as you would have them done unto you. Friends, many of us are actual immigrants or refugees or the children of immigrants or refugees. We know how difficult it is to start our lives all over with just $10 in our pocket. We've seen how our parents struggled with this and how they labored to get us where we are today. But more importantly, all of us in this room who profess faith in Christ know what it's like to be a spiritual sojourner in the land of slavery to sin. We know what it's like to be oppressed by sin and suffer at the hands of injustice. Without undermining the horrific experience of literal slavery, the Exodus narrative in the Old Testament is a spiritual analogy of our lives in the New Testament. And so despite our oppression by sin, we too, so as much as we are victims to the oppression of sin, we are actually also victimizers. We're also guilty of sin, and we need a sacrificial savior, just as the Israelites, in their literal oppression to slavery, were also guilty of their own sins and needed the blood of the sacrificial lamb to cover them. We are not, like, strictly categorized as oppressed and oppressor. We are all both. Only through Jesus, then, can we have this ultimate need of the sacrificial lamb to be, to be freely, uh, to, to have our sins forgiven. Only Jesus, only through Jesus, and only Jesus can be offered up for our sins to experience, for us to experience everlasting liberation from oppression. Only through Jesus can we transition from spiritual sojourner to adopted children. 
Only through Jesus can we finally come to our Heavenly Father where He prepares a feast for us. When we had nothing to buy our freedom, nothing to offer to God, He took us in any way. So who are we to make such demands of sojourners today? Who are we to say, you have nothing to offer our society so we can't take you in? All of our spiritual blessings have been freely offered to us in faith. So how can we not love the sojourner in our midst, regardless of their class, ethnicity, or gender? This is how the gospel shapes us to then holistically love our sojourner neighbors. Perhaps this is a good place then to transition to communion. It is Communion Sunday today. Communion has its roots in the day of Passover. Shortly before the Israelites were granted their freedom from slavery in Egypt, it symbolically marked the Israelites as the forgiven people of God as they, as they departed for the promised land. Friends, as we take communion today, let us remember that through Christ, we are already home spiritually but not yet physically. By faith, Jesus has made our bodies his home and dwells inside of us now, and that's why we can say we are home with Christ. And yet we await his physical return. And as such, we take communion in remembrance of our forgiven reality and our status as spiritual sojourners journeying to our final home. The consummation of the promised land, the true and better promised land. Communion is a reminder for us now that those who have been forgiven much love much. And so at this time, um, the ushers will dismiss you by rows. And please walk um, to the sides, uh, up to the front, and take the communion elements back to your seats if you are a professing baptized believer. And we will then partake of them together as a church family. If you have not yet professed faith or have not yet been baptized and you, or you're just a visitor unsure about your faith, we're so glad you're here. We're so glad that you would sit through this sermon today. We, but we still want to invite you to walk up with everyone else, but we ask you to refrain from taking the elements. And we want, you, we want to encourage you to take this time to reflect on what we shared today about the faithfulness of our God through the uh, in our lives through Jesus Christ. About how he brought us home when we were once sojourners. And that he, how he wants to bring you home as well. The same mercies he extends to his children, he offers you as well. So ushers, you may dismiss um, everyone by row.
disciples as I ministering in his name give this bread to you and said take and eat this is my body which is broken for you do this in remembrance of me in the same manner he also took cup and having given thanks as he had done in his name he gave it to his disciples saying this cup is a new covenant in my blood which is shed for many for the remission of sins drink from it all of you in remembrance of me Jesus Christ, thanks and praise be to you. Again, you fed us at your table with your own body and blood by your word and supper. May we continue to be led from this world of sorrow into life eternal. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 